if you need a, uh, some sermon notes, uh, we've got them available for you. Anybody like a copy of notes? We're going to get them in your hands and uh, just kind of raise your hands in the air if you're a note taker. I think this is going to be very, very helpful to you. We've been doing a study, a study on discipleship and how do we grow in our relationship, our relationship with Christ. And specifically, how do we take the examples that Christ has given us in his word and apply them to our life? Discipleship is like we become disciplined, like, you know, we go take karate courses. Uh, me and our brothers, we used to, I have five brothers. We used to practice karate on one another. You know, we we would watch Bruce Lee back in the day and we would just we would just we would just start kicking and chopping at each other. You know, we would try some of the stuff. And and that's what discipleship's all about. You know, we would uh. We would do some stuff. Don't let us watch. We would way back in the day. They had a guy named Hacksaw Jim Duggan and all those guys that were wrestlers. And my goodness, you got five brothers. You can create some fun. You watch that WWF or whatever it was back in the day and the junkyard dog. And we would just try all these moves on each other. So we're in this series on discipleship. It's kind of funny, but we're in the series on discipleship. So what God is wanting to teach us is how do we apply his principles to our life? And so that's what discipleship's all about. Like you learn discipline, you learn something that you didn't know, and now you take it and you apply it to your life. So today we're talking about the anointing of Christ, the anointed for greatness. And the more I study this topic of the anointing of Christ, the more I realize that this is like a 52 week study in itself. So we're going to scratch the surface today and get started on the anointing of Christ and what that really means, the word anointing and how it applies to our life. So here last week, we talked about John chapter seven, verse 37 and 39. And we found these words. It says at the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and he cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, he says, let them come to me and drink. And it's he who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart, or out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. It says, but this he spoke concerning the spirit who, whom those believing him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. But it's talking about the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus gives us to make us like rivers of living water. I told a story. Story this morning that the first time one of I took one of my college football coaches, they took me out. We all went out fishing like we was all country boys. I said, man, I, let's go out and catch some fish. And we went out fishing, Brooke. And I was I was used to like fishing in Oklahoma. You know, so some, some of us were Oklahoma, some of us from Arkansas, some of us was from right here in Missouri. We, we all went out, but all of us was country boys. And so we all got our fishing poles and I thought we were going to go do what we do in Oklahoma. We go around a pond. You know what I'm saying? We go around the pond. You can get around that pond. Ain't anything biting about 30 minutes. You just go down the road in a quarter mile to the next one. But not this guy. He was, our coach took us. So we went out to a river to fish. And I, it was a river, but it was kind of like a creek because it wasn't very big. And when I got out in the river, talking about the rivers of living water flowing out of us, we got out into the creek and some parts of the creek were as wide as this room and some part of the creek were as wide as this highway. But there's other parts of the creek that were really deep and we had to wade through that water, holding our fishing poles above our head. And then I got out to a part of the creek where the water was just going over rocks and I would take, try to take and place my foot on the rock. And then when I try to place my foot on the rock, the current of the river, the current of that little bitty creek, even though it was six inches of water, was so powerful, there was no way that I could put my foot in that place where I thought it should go. And what God is saying to us is, look, we, he's got the person of the Holy Spirit that his current is so powerful when it comes out of us. It's like a it's, it's a river. It's like whatever it comes in contact with the person of the Holy Spirit is going to cause us to bring about transformation and everything changes. Everything changes when we come out and come in contact with Jesus. Everybody say change. change. Everything changes. This is what we're talking about today. So the people that were standing around Jesus, it says here in verse 40, it says, therefore, many of the crowd, when they heard this saying, they heard that Jesus saying he's going to give us this living water when we come to him and we believe in him. It says, this is a true prophet. And others said, this is the Christ. And some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was. And so there was division. Everybody say division. Yeah. Among the people, I say, hey, listen, we believe in him. Some of them say, no, 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 we don't know anything about him. It, it says that, that was the vision among the people because of Jesus. And now, now 
Some of them wanted to take Jesus, like to arrest him and, and try to kill him, but no one laid hands on him. And now we see who's behind the scenes orchestrating like the premature crucifixion of Christ. And we see that the people that were behind this whole attempt to take Jesus hostage were the officers that came and the chief priests and the Pharisees who said unto them, why have you not brought him? And says the officers answered, said, no man has ever spoke like this man. Like that's never been a person person that we ran into that's never been a person that we've experienced that speaks like him do you know what he just said can you comprehend what he's saying the magnitude of what he's saying with the spirit of God coming on us and we can be like rivers of living water verse 47 and the Pharisees answered unto them and said are you deceived have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him but the crowd that does not the, the, the but the crowd that does not know the law is a curse and so Nicodemus he pipes up he said unto them who came to Jesus by night, being one of the Pharisees, said unto them, does our law judge a man before it hears and knows him, knows what he's doing? Verse 52, and says, they answered and said unto him, are you also of Galilee? Search the scripture, for no prophet has risen out of Galilee. And says that everyone went, everyone went to his own house. And that's a lot of reading. But today, but today the goal is that we will walk away from this place with an understanding of what it means for us to have access to the anointing and anointing of Jesus Christ and how great that opportunity is for us. Let us pray. Father, we bless you and we thank you that just for a few moments you're going to speak to our hearts and open our understanding, reveal to us the power of your anointing and what the power of your anointing does to transform the world around us. So we are requesting, even before we know access to it, that you will cause our lives to be, be changed and yes. to be made new. In the mighty, mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. So I'm reminded of uh, the current, talking about the current of the river. How many of you all were here in like the 90, I think it was a 92 flood when the Glasgow River like flooded out and washed the road out and all that stuff between Glasgow and Slater? Anybody? Any, some of y'all remember that back in the day? I, I wasn't here at that time, but I heard about how, you know, devastating it was and how that river washed everything out. But that's the type of power that Jesus is saying we've got access to. So here, let's look at these few verses here in John chapter 40. Uh, John chapter 7, verse 40 says, Therefore, many of the crowd, when they heard this saying, they said, Truly, this is the prophet. Everybody say the prophet. Okay, and says, and, and then verse 41 says, Others says, This is the Christ. Everybody say the Christ. And some said, Will the Christ come out of Galilee? So what we want to focus on today is the word Christ. And that word Christ means, the word Christ means to be anointed of God and, and to, or to be anointed of to be the anointed of the Lord. So those are the two meanings of Jesus name. So what does this word mean? The word anoint means to set apart. The word anoint means to make full. We see examples in the Bible of there's three types of anointings that we can find. The first type of anointing is the anointing of kings. The second type of anointing is the anointing of priests. And the third type of anointing is the anointing of prophets. So if the, the king is really like in reverse order, it really should be, you know, the, the prophets and the priests and then, uh, then the, the king. But the, but the king David in his anointing, we find this in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 12. Uh, uh, we're gonna go, we won't go to verse 23, but uh, we see that King David was anointed king. Now, we know King David's story. So the, the, the prophet Samuel, uh, he came to... Uh, King David's house and he's been sent by God to King David's house and he, he goes to King David's dad and if King David has all these David's dad had all these sons Jesse had all his sons line up and the man of God came out and said no, have you got any more sons and what was David doing when the king the, when Samuel asked that he was out there with his flock but when he when he showed up this is what happens verse 12 it says that so he he sent and brought him and going, going to send his brothers out to grab David and bring him before the man of God. And says now he, David was Rudy uh, and, 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 and he says that David had bright eyes and David was good looking. And the Lord, Lord spoke to the man of God while David standing right in front of him. 
And he says, arise and anoint him for he is the one. And Samuel took the horn of oil and he says, and Samuel anointed David in the midst of his brothers. And it says, and the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and went to Ramah. And the wonderful thing about this whole passage is, it's like there's no real big change in David's life other than the word that the spirit of the Lord came upon David. And David went right back out to doing the thing that he was doing before with this vision in his heart that, hey, listen, someday I'm going to be the king of Israel. I imagine he laid out in the stars as he listened to his sheep snore at night and he carried the stars. He thought about how awesome a God it is that we serve, that he's chosen me to be king of Israel. I imagine God began as the spirit of God came on David, that David, you start to have dreams of being the king of Israel. David started to have dreams about being a mighty warrior. David's life changed from the perspective of he became a dreamer and started wondering, okay, what does this life look like with God now that he's anointed me to be king? And so my question to you is like, what's God's dream for you? And what's God anointed you to do that maybe you are looking at your situation? You're saying, hey, man, they don't look no different than they ever have. I, is there anybody other than Bobby God when sitting in this room that you believe in God for something and your situation is not looking like what God spoke to you or what God said to you or what you were believing God for. And you going back into doing the normal things that you normally do. And, and we see that happen to the disciples too, right? When Jesus was crucified and they took him and laid him in the tomb. It says that at third day that Jesus was, came and found his disciples. What were they doing? They was right back out there on the boats and fishing and casting that net. And he said, listen, why don't you cast your net on the other side of the boat and then let down in the draft. Deep. Like he, they went back to doing what was normal because there seemed to be like no change in our life. But in King David's situation, you know that he was anointed king because God had a plan for him. And this whole reason that we're talking about him, because Jesus is anointed king of kings and Lord of lords. So there's no authority that we'll ever face in this earth that has more authority, more power, more dominion than the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we call on the king of kings, we approach his throne and we ask him for grace. We ask him for mercy. We ask him for compassion. He's going to look at our situation. He's going to use his authority that we crawl up. I used to tell everybody in Marcia, she, when I was acting crazy 25 years ago, she just crawled up in her daddy's lap talking about God and she she start she start ratting me out telling how bad her husband I was being and all the things that I was doing wrong and I told her I ain't changing I'm moving on with my life but how many of you know when God gets a hold of you baby everything changes wow. yes. I, I, I'm here to tell you some of us are believing for family members that are unwilling to be saved and I was one of those unwilling participants but now I'm not more powerful than the king of kings and the lord of lords and he showed up in my world and he changed my world and he'll do it for you it will do it for your family in Jesus name. The second type of anointing that we see is anointing of priests, anointing of priests. And this is it's, it's Moses found in Exodus chapter 28, verse 41, the anointing of priests, Exodus chapter 28, verse 41. This is God speaking to Moses and God tells Moses right here in verse 41. It says, so shall you put them on Aaron, right? The anointing oil. And on his brothers and on his sons with him, and you shall anoint them, you shall consecrate them, and you shall sanctify them, and they and they that they may minister as priests. So this is God's first time that we see the anointing happening of the office of priest. It's happened right here with Aaron. And we see that we want to study and understand that Jesus is our great high priest. So it's Jesus that came and he offered himself as a sacrifice for us, that the blood of Jesus became payment for our sins past, present, and future. And if we want to get really serious about it, Jesus' blood is payment for every generational sin, every sin that's ever been committed against anybody, against God from any of our family members, going all the way back to Adam. Jesus' blood is that powerful. And when we will just take the blood of Jesus and we'll apply it to our life and apply it to our family, and apply it to our situations, that his blood will transform us and Jesus will make us righteous. He'll make us holy. He'll make us pure. He'll make us accepted by God when we exercise this opportunity that we have to walk in that anointing that Jesus has. The third anointing that we see is from this person that's, that's a prophet, but his name is Samuel. And Samuel's anointing is not necessarily anointing like we would see anointing with oil, but his anointing was by revelation. I've never seen this before. Anointing by revelation. It goes on to say here in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, it says, so Samuel grew. Now the story about Samuel growing is Samuel came from a mama. His, mo his mama's name was Hannah. 
And every year, St. Hannah would go to the temple and she would get up here and she would come to the altar on Sunday's brook and she would just lay her head on the altar and she would cry. And a preacher would think, girl, what you doing coming in there drinking? Like you've been, you've been out partying all night. You just come from the club. You came from the club. And it, and it sort of said that the, the priest was, he, he come, Eli said, what you doing in here? Like, come, come to church sober. And she's like, no, I ain't drunk. Like, I'm crying because, you know, I'm barren. I don't have any children. And uh, it says that Eli prayed for her. Now, Eli had some boys that wasn't doing right. Eli, has, Eli had sons that were actually living and doing wrong things, stealing money, having sex with women in the church. Like, and Eli wasn't doing anything about it. But this lady Hannah was God's solution to the problem that Eli was unwilling to address with his sons. So when Hannah came, Eli prayed for Hannah. And Hannah got pregnant. And she was in a situation where they had more than one wife. So one wife, she had lots of kids. And Hannah didn't have nothing, right? And so the one that had kids said, baby, I'm having another baby this year. And what you got, girl? You ain't going to have, you ain't going to ever have that. Look, look at all these, you know, so she had that situation situation going on some jealousy I'm sorry but you know what to add it was a little edgy attitude you know what I'm saying like I, I that's I, I'm the only one in this house that can have children from, from from my husband my husband you know so she probably had a little attitude but Hannah she approached it the right way Hannah didn't come confrontational Hannah came to the altar and she cried out to God and when she cried out to God it says God bless her to conceive and when the child Samuel was weaned she brought him and she promised God when she prayed to him she promised God if you will bless me with a child I will give my child to you and I will dedicate him to you. And many of us, we made promises to God. We made promises to God. And sometimes we keep them promises and sometimes we don't, don't we? But if we learn from Hannah, we're going to give that promise, give the thing that God bless us with back to him. And when we give it back to him, God will bless and anoint. And it says that Hannah, every year she would bring Samuel clothing. And as he grew Every year she bring him a new set of clothes. Every year he grows, she comes see him once a year. And I don't know about you, mamas, but that's a pretty difficult thing that you come see your baby boy. That's last year he was, you know, two feet tall. This year he's three feet. Next year you come, he's four feet tall and he's growing, he's growing, he's growing. And you're seeing him mature and you're seeing the distance like he don't even know like that you're his mother. But it says that Samuel grew, the Lord was with Samuel. And it says, and, and, and let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. So everything that Samuel said would happen because God was with him. God would cause those things to happen. And it says in all of Israel. So the fame went out on Samuel. Like he didn't have to work for it. The fame went out on Samuel from Dan to Bathsheba. It says that the people of Israel knew that Samuel had been established. Everybody say established. Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. And it goes on to say, then the Lord appeared, the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. So God was making revelation for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So God was making an appearance to Samuel. And what is this all about? It's about us recognizing that just as Samuel was prophet, that we've got Jesus Christ who came who was prophet of prophets. We see all of the prophecies of Jesus and found in Revelations. And we want to go over there, go over those. But let's talk about the anointing of Jesus, the anointing of Jesus. The first place that we see here in the New Testament, where we see the words anointed in Jesus in the same passage. It's found in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. It says, now how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and Jesus went about doing good and healing all who oppressed the devil, for God was with him. Everybody say change. change. So Jesus, when he came to earth, it says that God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. And Jesus didn't sit down with his Holy Spirit and his power. Say, baby, don't I look good in my Holy Spirit and my power? I'm telling you, I, everybody can see it's like radiating off of me. I think I'll just sit, lay back and, you know, eat some grapes and cheese and crackers and, you know, sip on some, you know, Kool-Aid or whatever they had back in there. No, it says that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. And the first thing that Jesus done when he was anointed with the Holy Spirit, it says that he went out, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And the very first, first person he took on was a person of the devil. And it says that Satan took him out and tempted him and said, hey, if you the son of God, cause these stones be made bread. If you the son of God, cast yourself off this and God will give his angels charge concerning you. If you're the son of God, won't you bow down and worship me? And I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. So if Satan is stupid enough to try to tempt his creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was in heaven with God at Satan's creation, right. how much do you think that he's going to come at you? Right. Right. So we have to stand on what the anointing of the Holy Spirit and 
stand on what God gives us to stand against the devil. He said, first thing you got to have, if you're going to stand against principalities and powers and rules and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places in Ephesians chapter 6, he said, you got to have a belt of truth on. So the first thing the devil's going to try to do is get you to start lying. So then you got to have your shield of faith. He's going to try to get you to walk in doubt and unbelief. He said, then you're going to have to have on a breastplate of righteousness. Because he's going to try to get you lying, cheating, and having going back in your old lifestyle and doing everything that you think you're big enough and bad enough to do. He said, you got to have on some righteousness. He said, you got to have your salvation on. You know, the devil's going to try to make you believe that God don't love you and try to make you believe that God, you're not worthy. You know, he's going to try to get you to live that lifestyle. He said, then you got to have a sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Then you have peace and prayer in your life. And when you have those things, he said, all you got to do is stand. The devil's going to see what you got on. He's going to say, I found the wrong person to mess with. But what do we do in life? I, y'all know I'm a football guy. I mean, some of y'all know it. But I got some little boys, a hundred and something of them that I'm popping. I'm like the principal of football. Uh, superintendent, whatever you want to call the big shots. Anyway, I'm that guy, you know, buys the helmets and the shoulder pads and the insurance and schedules games and does all that. I would never remotely even think about sending one of my little football players out without a helmet on. Son, we're going to get out here and play, but today you don't have to wear your helmet. No, I would never do that. How much more in the spirit should we put on salvation every single day? God, I want you to save my mind and save my thoughts and save my imaginations and cause me to think about what you've done on Calvary's cross for me every single day. God, I don't ever want to lose focus with that. Like, I don't want to lose focus with that. We've seen this crazy thing happen where the football player ripped off the quarterback's helmet and was swinging it. How dumb is that? Like, that's what exactly what we don't want the devil doing, grabbing our face mask and taking our helmet off. That ain't happening. I mean, I'm sorry for getting all into that. But anointing that Jesus, the anointing that Jesus came with, he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. And it says that Jesus, he went about doing good. He got off his, his uh, he, got, he got to work. <laughs> Jesus got to work. He got up and he started doing something with what God gave him. And that's what he came to do for us. The same Jesus that went about doing good and healing all who oppressed the devil is right here today to heal us and heal us of any form of oppression where the devil's got his foot on our throat in a situation. God, Jesus came for me and you. Everybody say Jesus came for us. He came and that's what he wants to do for us today. The next thing that we see about Jesus anointing is found here in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. In Isaiah 11, 2, we see these words, the spirit of the Lord God shall rest upon Jesus. And it says, and Jesus will have a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of understanding, a spirit of counsel, a spirit of might, and a spirit of fear of the Lord, a spirit of knowledge, and a spirit of the fear of the Lord. And oftentimes when I'm praying, I get my notebook out. And I take a pen and I place it beside my notebook because you know what? I, when I approach the throne of God and when I'm praying, I want to hear directly from God. And as I'm praying and I'm asking questions, my expectation is that the counselor is going to show up and he's going to give me some solutions to the problems that I'm facing. So how many of us in this room that we have problems that we're facing and we need what Jesus can give us by providing us counsel? So oftentimes we, you know, I took a trip to Atlanta last week with my daughter and I would have never found Atlanta without that Jeep that lady on there I mean the GPS thing now she had a lady on there from her lady was from from England from England from exit 281a stay in the right lane for approximately 1,000 feet use the center aisle like I mean she was from England and she broke and she got mad at you like if I turn one way the screen would just go black with her like she didn't even try to redirect you nothing like she She's like, I don't know where you're going, but like, once you get back on my route, I'm going to help you. I was like, what is this lady doing? Good thing I had on my phone the lady from America. You know, she understood. My point is, my point is, it's like, where are we going with God's given? God has a God-given destination he's taking us to. He, he's trying to get us someplace, and I don't know about you. It, it, I mean, even like in St. Louis or Kansas City or any place, I, I've gone downtown in St. Louis just to find Kenna Plaza. Like, we done a prayer thing for pastors there a couple months ago, and I would have never found it without the lady. You know, she, I would have never found it. I, I just wouldn't, and it's a big place. I would have never found it. The point of the matter is, how much more are we and you needing the counseling of the Lord Jesus Christ to help us get to the God-given destination 
that he has for us. And we gotta, we got to enter into his presence. we got to sit at his feet. And we got to ask him to help us. I'm sorry for going on that. But anyway, praise God for it. The final thing that we see concerning, concerning the anointing of Christ is found here in Isaiah 61, verse 1. Look at this. Jesus got to get dirty. He's already doing something. Acts 10, 38, God anointing with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good, healing all who oppressed the devil. Now we see in the next verse, Isaiah 11, 2, that he has a spirit of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, power, counsel, and might. He's going to be your GPS through life if you would activate his services and call him to help you in your time of struggle. When things get dark, things get black, you don't understand where you're going. He says, if you would just call me to counsel you. Then he says, hey, 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 hey. Hey, that's all by you giving me invitation. Let me give you one more thing that you may not even know that you can do. He says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, Jesus, because the Lord has anointed me, Jesus, to preach good tidings to the poor. First thing that you need to know, your situation is not hopeless. Everybody say, my situation is not hopeless. So we got to engage God. He says, I'm going to preach good tidings to the poor. I love the story of the man that had his son that was... That was demon possessed. And a son, he says, the man, Jesus sent his disciples out. And the disciples, they went out and they was healing everybody. The people that were blind were seeing and the lame were walking. And people that had leprosy were being healed. And the people that were paralyzed, you know, like paralytics, like John the wheelchair with thumb. Man, they, they went and they prayed for those people. And all of a sudden, those fingers that wouldn't move started moving. The arms and everything, they stood up and they, uh, they, Hey, they start doing the wave from back in the day. My point is, like, the people that the disciples were touching, things were way back in the 80s. <laughs> people, we have this thing going on at the Godwin House. It's pretty vicious about, like, way back in the 1900s. But we won't bring that to life church ever, will we, sweetie? Ever. <laughs> but anyway, but, but, it's, but the people that they were touching that were paralyzed, like, I, I mean, just, it's just, it baffles my mind. The anointing and the power that was on the Lord Jesus Christ, that when someone was bound and in that condition, that he spoke to that condition. And that person that's been frozen in that locked state position, that instantly made whole and that life was restored. And his disciples seen that and the disciples done that. But it says they came on a situation, Brooke, that was more powerful than them. This man had a little boy that had seizures. And it says the boy had seizures and he would fall on the ground and he would gnash at his teeth and he would foam at the mouth and he would shake violently. And the disciples, they just been going through healing, 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 healing. And they lay hands on this boy and they heal. And a couple of them say, man, this ain't nothing happening. Y'all come over and help me. And the two of them pray and nothing happened. And then three of them prayed for him and nothing happened. And then four of them prayed for him and nothing happened. And then all 12 of them got around and started rebuking and crying and snotting and everything else. And nothing happened to this little boy. And the daddy's disappointed and the disciples disappointed. I think Jesus set them up, set them up for a comeback. <laughs> Jesus set them up for a comeback. Say, boys, I'm going to let you know something, that you're going to run against something, that the only way that th- something that your face is going to change, it's going to be because you spent time in my presence in prayer and fasting. That it's not going to change because you speak to it. It's going to change because you're going to spend time with me. And when you spend time with me, my anointing is going to rest on you. And the situation that sees the anointing that I place on you, it's going to change. So they brought the boy to Jesus and they laying him at his at his feet and we're talking about the good news of Jesus. We're talking about the good news and the good news. So the little boy and the daddy come and, and the daddy Jesus say, Boy, you got my disciples, y'all ain't got any faith. Oh ye a little faith and then the boy dad brings a son and what happens? The son he does exactly what he does with, with the disciples. He laid on the ground and he starts shaking and foaming and everything else and the dad is looking at Jesus now he's crying. Man, what kind of devil is this? Like, this devil is even more powerful than Jesus. He he throwing my son down in front of Jesus, and then and it, he's shaking like he's always did. He's foaming like he's always did. And Jesus looks at the dad and says, "Son, son, 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 son the son is down there." Ah, 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 ah. And Jesus says, "Hey, hey, look at me. Like, how long has he been in this condition?" And at that moment, you know, I wish I could have been there. Like, he locks eyes with Jesus. And I think you can see something in someone's eyes. But he locks eyes with Jesus. And I think what he looked in the disciples' eyes and seen was fear. 
But when he looked in Jesus' eyes, he seen faith and boldness. He looked in Jesus' eyes and he seen that this situation, Jesus wanted him to know that the situation he was looking down at was not more powerful than him. And what's my point to you? That there's a situation that may seem dark to us, but if we would take our eyes off of Jesus and we would listen to his words, he said to the daddy, how long has he been in this situation? And the dad began to open spill his guts off since a child. Like ever since the boy was little, like he was a toddler and he would fall out. He's often trying to fall in him. The devil tried to throw him in a fire and the water to destroy him. But he says, Jesus, if you can do anything, if you can do anything, would you help us? If you can do anything. Jesus says, if you can believe, I can, I can do it. And what Jesus wanted him to do is take his eyes off the problem that he was facing and look square in the eyes of the anointing. And when he looked in the eyes of the anointing, he knew that the situation that he was facing was not hopeless. And I'm telling every single one of you in this room, you got some stuff going on in your life that's violent, that's shaking, that's foaming, that's gnashing at the teeth, that you don't know how you avoided destruction with it. And all I want you to do is stop looking at that problem and start looking into the eyes of Jesus. And when you look in the eyes of Jesus, you're going to find faith and you're going to find the good news, the good news to make you rich in faith, to help you overcome that. And it says Jesus came in to heal the brokenhearted. And it says that Jesus came to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And that is a situation that many of us face that maybe we've been taken captive by something. You know, we've seen captives before. Like captives, they ain't taken, like they ain't going, like they want to fight, but like they lost their weapons. They want to not be held captive, but sometimes the captives, we see them, they, they got their hands up in the air. They're all marching in one direction. And normally it's some kind of armed militant person that's behind them with some kind of machine gun or machete or some weapon that the captives don't have. And they're taking those captives off. And this is what Jesus wants you to know. It's found, and I started to read it today. It's, it's found in Psalms. But it says that Jesus came to take captivity captive. You know, that's a wonderful promise. So whatever is captivating us. It's not more powerful than our Lord Jesus Christ that came to captivate it. And the King David was the one prime example that King David, they'd been out fighting. And they came back to the camp where the wife and women and children were. And so when they came back to camp, everybody was gone. The camp had been raided. Tents and stuff flipped over. It says David and all his war men, they got sick, you know, like they, they, they grieved them so much. They began to tear their clothes and throw dust up in there and cry. And David, that's just when I think he said that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Yeah. That even though the situation looked bleak, it said that David encouraged himself in the Lord. And David said, wait, 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 wait. These men are ready to kill me. But God, I know you with me. You, you were there when I killed a lion and a bear that tried to kill my sheep. God, you won't abandon me in this situation. And David got along with God and said, God, shall we go up? God say, I want you to go up. Like, not only are you going to go up, but you're going to recover also. Everything that had David's wife and kids and all that company captive, David and his men came and surrounded that situation. They took those men that had taken their families. My point is to you, it's like when we engage God, when we engage God, if there's something that has taken us captive, Jesus came to take it captive. If it's taken one of our family members captive, Jesus came to take it captive. He won't wants everything to be changed in our world. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to pray. Father, we bless you. And we thank you that uh, your anointing, Lord Jesus, is here for us to transform our life, to make all things new, to give us hope, to give us freedom. We stand on these few words that we heard today, that you are our counselor, you are our wisdom, you're our understanding, you're our power, you're our might. You give us fear of the Lord and we stand on your word and on your anointing. We thank you for the greatness of your anointing. We thank you, God, that we can come to you. And when we feel like we're bound or when we feel like we're in prison, when we feel like there's no hope for our situation, that you show up as the God of all power and all majesty and all dominion to cause our situation to change. Acts 10, 38 says that God anointed you, Lord Jesus, with the Holy Spirit and power, that you went about doing good and healing all who are oppressed of the devil. So today we give you authorization to do good in our life. 
heal every situation in our life where the devil has wig wiggled his way and, and, and wrapped his coils around us to choke the light out of life out of us, to choke life out of our marriage, to choke life out of our finance, to choke life out of our health, to choke life out of our family and the substance of our family, to choke, to choke the life out of our relationships. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're causing every oppressive spirit that's warring against us, our families, our church, our cities, our schools, our governments, the businesses that we represent. In the name of Jesus, we get this all to you. And we thank you that your anointing, your anointing, your anointing destroys the yoke. We praise you, thank you, God, that you're unfastening that everything around us that the enemy has placed on us to be um, a tool of discouragement embarrassment, a tool of shame and um, oppression in the name of Jesus. So Father, as your people, we stand on your word and we come against every spirit of shame and rejection and impure thoughts and motives and God, every spirit of abuse in Jesus' mighty name, every spirit of depression and oppression in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, God, that we can stand before you as your children and boldly, boldly approach your throne of grace. Jesus, just as you anointed David King, we just thank you that you're the King of Kings and that you're the Lord of Lords. There's no situation more powerful than you. So, God, we just place the situations that are opposing us at your feet. We thank you that one word with you, one word from you, causes our situation to turn around. So we ask God that you would speak. That we'd ask that your presence would rest on us as your people. That you would make all things new in our life. We'd accept the sacrifice that you gave of your blood for our sins, our transgressions, our iniquities, to bang, uh, bring us back in the right relationship with God. And we need that right now, Father. We need that right now bring us back in the right relationship with you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here in this room, he said, Pastor Bobby, I need all of that. My whole world needs an anointing touch from the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be saved. If that's you, just going to simply ask you on the count of three just to lift your hand in the air and we're going to pray a simple prayer together. One, two, three. Please you raise your hands for me. Raise your hands with me. We're going to pray together. We're going to pray together. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Everybody, please repeat after me, dear Lord Jesus. Thank you for your anointing of your blood that saves me, forgives me of all my sins, all my transgressions, all my iniquities, which is all the sins of all of my forefathers, going all the way back to Adam. We thank you for that purchase. We thank you for your blood that forgives us. So Lord Jesus, I'm asking that you would touch, that you would heal, that you would transform every single person that's raised their hand to you as an acknowledgement to say yes to you. Say yes to you. In Jesus' name, I pray your choice blessings over every single person under the sound of my voice under the sound of my voice. And I'm going to ask that um, uh, if you're here and uh, you need God to touch you, like you really know that you, you can put your hands down. You, you know that you really need God to touch you, like there's some crisis that you're facing, there's a situation that you're going through, there's some pain that you're experiencing, maybe heartbreak, the brokenheartedness that we read about today is very apparent in your situation. I just sincerely believe that God wants you to come to this altar and we want to touch you, we want to pray with you, we want to agree with you that God can and will change your situation and turn that around. So at the end of the service, I'm going to just ask that you would just make your way up this way and uh, we want to stand in agreement with you. Just engage God in your situation. He's going to, he's going to turn it around. He's going to turn it around. He's going to turn it around. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I bless these that uh, are going to give today. We thank you for your faithfulness uh, to Life Church and 
your faithfulness to every single person that's represented here. Um, to cause their situations, Lord, to be um, made new. Thank you, Father God, for every financial provision, every job, every income that we have that we can stop and we can bring back and give back to support your house. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your faithfulness to us, that you've been good to every single one of us. So today, we just want to give back to you according to your, your goodness to us. And you said that we should bring up tithes and the first fruits and our offerings into your house and sow seeds. So God, in the name of Jesus, we bless this offering that your people are going to give. And we ask that you would move in a mighty, mighty way. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you for doing it. Amen and amen.